الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سبلنا سبحان ربك رب العزه اما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم Uh, the last couple of days, actually, yesterday evening, I had the opportunity to spend some time with uh, Sheikh Zulfiqar in Atlanta. And um, actually that evening, we were sitting around with some of the brothers there, and um, Mufti Moana Kamal actually shared some insight. And um, <clears throat> so I thought I would share some of that with everyone here and add a little bit to it, actually. If you look at the way that the Arabic language is constructed, you have three base letters, and then those base letters, they are used to form various words. And often they say that the mustar, the mustar is sort of the ing form, like running, walking, reading. That's how you want to think about the mustar. And they say that the mustar, mustar means source in the Arabic language, spring or source. And they say that the mustar is actually the source of Arabic words for each particular word. So one word in the Arabic language is called irada. Irada. Irada means to intend or to desire. And from that mustar, there are two words which are essential to the salik. Salik means that person who is traveling on the path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from that mustar, from irada, there are two words that can be derived. Number one is murid, a person who seeks. And number two is murad the one who is sought. Okay, murid is the ism fa'il. Ism fa'il means the one who, who seeks to do the action of the, of the verb. So there's a seeker who's called a murid, and there's one who is sought, the ism maf'ul, who's called the murad. Now every Muslim who's sincere, every believer who's sincere in their path, in their saluk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they come in between these two categories. They're always bouncing between being a murid and being a murad. Each person. Now, by murid, we mean someone that actively seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his nearness. And by murad, we mean the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeks to bring near to him. Did you see the difference? One is seeking, the other is being sought. And each person in this room, sometimes they're a murid, and at times they're a murad. What do we mean by that? Well, most of you or many of you can go back into your lives and you can find a time when you were distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of us in this room can go back into our lives and we can find a time when we were distant from Allah. The last thing on our mind was the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet out of some miracle of His, He ended up drawing us near to Him and waking us up to the reality of Islam. Right? In that case, we were murad. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He took His mercy and He individually showered it upon individuals within this room so that they could be drawn nearer to Allah. Right? Out of no effort of their own. It wasn't even as if they were trying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of His own mercy, just randomly chose some people and decided that I want this person to be near to me. He was intended, that person was intended by Allah to be brought near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that case, that person would be called a murad. Now that same murad later on, after that initial high, after that initial encounter with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then has to make effort in, in order to continue to attain nearness to Allah, or in order to become nearer to Allah. And in that case, that person becomes a murid. Did you see the difference? Now some people, they start out their lives being murid. Meaning they themselves recognize that they want to get closer to Allah. They've tried everything in the world. There was nothing there. Or their parents raised them that way. So they start out doing zikr. Or they start out reading Quran. They start out on ilm. And those people are murid from the beginning. And then at times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy, despite their minimum effort, brings them very close. At that time they become murad. So some people start out as murid. And then they become murad. Other people start out as murad. And eventually they become murid. The basis though for both people is the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning the essence of both of those people, whether you're murid at one time or whether you're murad at one time, is that is the zikr and the remembrance of Allah. Now that person who, who is a murid, 
the essence and the force that drives him nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the remembrance of Allah. Right? So they seek the nearness of Allah through recitation of the Quran, through salawat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through making istighfar, through making muraqaba. All of these are types of adhkar and that's how the murid progresses towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the murad, even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws an individual near to them, the sign of their being a murad is that the dhikr of Allah becomes alive in their life. Now when somebody becomes a murad, what happens? They begin to pray. They begin to recite the Qur'an. They begin to recite salawat. They begin to write, recite istighfar. So in both cases, the means is still the same. Whether Allah drew that person near to them or whether they tried to draw themselves near to Allah, in both cases, the essence, sort of the, the thing that provides the benefit is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for us, that's essential. Because either we're murid or we're murad, we're only in two states. We only have two choices. In this journey, either Allah is coming closer to us or we're coming closer to Him. And actually, often both are occurring at the same time. But the basis of the travel of the journey, the, the, the fuel of the journey, is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the remembrance of Allah provides two benefits. Provides two benefits. One we covered last week. Last week I mentioned to you that famous hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he explicated five things that were commanded to Yahya alayhi salam and subsequently those five things were then commanded by Yahya alayhi salam to Bani Israel. Those five things were number one, to not associate partners with Allah. Number two, to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, to fast in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, to give sadaqah in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number five, to excessively remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in the fifth one, in that fifth point, Yahya alayhi salam, when he's standing before Bani Yisrael in the Bayt al-Muqaddis, he's standing on that balcony and he's explaining to them, these are the five commands that Allah has given me. I'm commanding you to do them. In that fifth case, Yahya alayhi salam, he makes a very clear example of the benefit of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that imagine that you have an enemy who incessantly pursues you. Imagine that you have an enemy who incessantly pursues you and you seek a fortress that is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning shaitan, he incessantly pursues us. And the fortress that protects us against that enemy is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, you think about it, I mean, the enemies, as I said last week, the enemies of this world, they're very limited, right? They may pursue you for a couple hours, in the end they leave you alone, right? They may pursue you for a couple years, in the end they leave you alone. But the one enemy out of all of creation that pursues you from the day you're born until the day you die is shaitan. Incessantly, he does not stop. The moment you're born, till the moment you expire, he is trying to deceive you and take you away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no enemy that exists in creation like that, no matter how bad. And the worst thing is, is that even if you had an enemy, let's say someone, someone follows you and tries to steal something from you, or the worst they can do is they can kill you, but they can't destroy your soul. Your body was going to be destroyed anyway. Shaitan destroys the most important part of you, which is your soul, which then ends up placing us in Jahannam. So there is no enemy like shaitan. And Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam is making it very clear that the protection against this enemy who is so incessant is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said clearly in this hadith that the dhikr of Allah is like a fortress. Now, for us, that's a very important analogy. Because what is entering that fortress? It's our deeds. Right? The essence of what you're trying to protect in that fortress by the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our deeds. And our deeds are the most important aspect of us because those deeds are what we have to present to Allah. And Shaitan, he wants to remove those deeds from us so that we have nothing to present to Allah on the Day of Judgment. Now, you can think about it. I mean, if you look at Citibank or these kind of banks, right? And you look at their annual budget. In their annual budget, they have a percentage of their income or their wealth that goes to thieves, right? They say, they already have it pre-planned. They know that this much identity theft is going to occur in a year. Roughly some millions of dollars of identity theft will occur. It's already pre-budgeted that we're going to lose this much money. But for them it makes no difference because they have so much wealth that if they lose a few million dollars, it has no effect upon their overall bottom line. 
But in our case, the story is totally different. Because we don't have that much. Right? Somebody who has nothing, they really fear a thief because they know that if that gets taken, they're not going to be able to replace it. Our case is the same. Now, people before us, they had deeds. They did things that were, pl- were pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have so little to present. When we look at our lives, we look at the time that we live in, the place that we live in, the distance that we live from the Kaaba, we look at the circumstances that we live in, and we look at our deeds, and they're so minuscule. Those few minuscule deeds, here we are trying to protect them so that Shaitan doesn't even rape us of those. I mean, how, what little we have to offer. And Shaitan, he still comes after us. So for us, building that fortress is extremely important. And that's what the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. It allows you to build a fortress to protect your heart from the attacks of Shaitan. So that's the first benefit of, of dhikr. And the second benefit of dhikr is that you get to interact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ways which are more incredible than anything that perhaps exists in this universe. And that's because you get to interact with the creator of the universe. And how unique is that? That That is just only the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allows us to interact with him. Now, the beauty of the excessive zikr is that a murid never gets bored. And even the murad never gets bored of their zikr. I mean, everything in life has a limit. If you enjoy pizza... I mean, I can only give you so many pizzas before you're totally sick of it. You just don't want it at some point, right? There comes a limit to everything. No matter how much you enjoy something, there comes a limit to it. And you see people who are addicted to the the life of this world, even they get bored of their own enjoyment, right? They get caught up in these video games. They play these video games for hours upon hours upon hours. Eventually, they get sick of it and they can't play it anymore, right? There's a limit to everything, no matter what it is, except the zikr of Allah. SubhanAllah, you find that the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the righteous after them, they never became sick of their zikr. It never bored them. And that's because every time you interact with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it's a new dimension. Every time you interact with Allah, it's a new dimension. Kulla yawmin huwa fi sha'an. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states that every single day, He is in a new splendor. And that actually is interpreted as every single moment. The mo- you can divide time into the smallest unit. Every single moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's in a new sha'an. Those are called, actually, in the, pl- the plural in Arabic, are called shuyun. Shuyun, the different splendors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the person who gets deep in their zikr, that's their experience. Every moment is a new sha'an. Every single moment, they're experiencing a new sh- one of the uh, different shuyun. And that doesn't only apply for the Prophet ﷺ, that also applies for, uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that also applies for the Prophet ﷺ. So somebody sitting and doing salawat, it's not a static dhikr. It's not like you just say salawat and you just get through it and you did it a hundred times and you're done. It's a dynamic process. You're sitting and thinking about the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ, in Nushan. You're thinking about the physical features of the Prophet ﷺ. You think about the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ. You think about the weeping of the Prophet ﷺ. You think about the eating of the Prophet ﷺ. You think about the smiling of the Prophet ﷺ. All of this should be, is that it's, it's an interactive way of remembering the, the blessings that the Prophet ﷺ has bestowed upon this Ummah. And each of those are called shun as well. Those are all splendors of the Prophet ﷺ. He showed himself in so many different ways. Sometimes you saw the, the splendor of the Prophet ﷺ as a mujahid. Sometimes you saw the splendor of the Prophet ﷺ as a worshiper. Sometimes you saw the splendor of the Prophet ﷺ in the way he dressed. Sometimes you saw the splendor of the Prophet ﷺ in his physical beauty. I mean, this is what the Sahaba were so in, 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 uh, they were so enamored with. That every time they looked at this man, it was a new shan. It was a new beauty. Sometimes they look at him and then they, uh, they pick up on his physical features and it just overwhelms them. They're comparing him, they're looking at the moon, they're looking at him, they're looking at the moon, they're looking at him, and they decide that he's more beautiful than even the full moon. Sometimes they're looking at the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ and they're completely enamored. Sometimes they're looking at the strength of the Prophet ﷺ and they're completely enamored. And so on one aspect, here they are interacting with Allah in this incredible zikr through salah and through the Qur'an and through saying subhanAllah, saying alhamdulillah. And then on the other side, the moment they turn their face away from there, they turn their face here and the Prophet ﷺ is right in front of them. They're interacting with the Prophet ﷺ in this way. So these are the shuyun, these are the tapes this is the splendor that exists for that person who truly gets deep in the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what the person, that's what the murid seeks. And that's what the murad is given. Now, you ask anybody, when they first change, right? Sister says, 
oh, I changed my life. I started wearing hijab. I changed the way I thought. I changed my desires. I changed my aspirations. And they'll tell you, every day there were chills going down my spine. Every day it was a different thing. Sometimes I was reading this ayah and tears would be coming down my eyes. Sometimes I'd be reading that ayah and tears would be coming down my eyes. Sometimes I would just be sitting and I would recognize the mercy of Allah. Tears would come down my eyes. I would have, I would have, you know, a shock running through my spine. That, that is all a, the sign of interacting with the shiyun of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, people who interact with the sunnah, they have the similar, a similar feeling. Sometimes they submit to one sunnah, sometimes they submit to another sunnah, and it's, a, it's the same kind of shiyun that they're interacting with. That's for the murad. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purposely draws that person near. But also for the murid, there's the same. But for the murid, it comes to excessive zikr. You have to force yourself. But eventually you also begin to interact with the shiyun in that way. Now, for us, the majority of our time is spent as murid. And then sometimes along the way, when you're really desperate, or it's becoming difficult, or you feel like there's no hope, Allah grabs your hand and gives you a little bit of becoming a murad. But most of the journey is through being murid. Usually the first step is murad. The first step Allah takes you, you're totally wandering here and there, Allah takes you and plants you on that journey. That is murad. Then sometimes Allah takes you for a couple of years and makes you take the first few steps, that is murad. But eventually He leaves you as murid. Eventually, he leaves you as murid. And then you're forced to travel. Now, then you stop and say, now what am I going to do? Well, how am I going to progress? Well, that's through your own effort. And then what happens is you make effort, you make effort. That's the majority of your time. You get to a point, and out of some weird mercy, either, either the month of Ramadan, or some other event, or some other unique interaction, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again takes your hand, and takes you forward on the next step, and makes you a murad for a few moments. But in essence, the, the, it's the murid, that attracts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making him murad. Once Allah takes you on those first few steps, if you waste it, then it's very difficult to even become murad at a later time. You still have to make the effort. And it's just these baby steps. You're not making very much, you're not make, covering very much distance, but the whole purpose of that effort is that you are waiting. It's a muraqaba. That's, that's what we call, even muraqaba is just a waiting as well. In muraqaba, when you just sit, you're basically waiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pull you forward that one step to get to the next lesson. Now, in the in essence, what that is, is that as a murid, you're hoping that that moment of being a murad will occur. And that's exactly what we do. Now, you sit and wait. You do a muraqaba, you sit and wait, and 95% of your muraqaba is battling your thoughts, battling your what's going on in your life. But once in a while, you get that special one. You get that special moment where you get pulled forward that next level. But you have to be a murid in order to become a murad once you've gotten on the path. Initially Allah puts people on the path by making them murad, but eventually when you're on that path, you have to be a murid to become a murad. And so all of us in this path are murids. We're intenders. We're people that seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to become excessive in our zikr, to become true in our pursuit of His nearness. And may He give us the oppor- those oppor- rare opportunities where He actually draws us nearer to Him without, through no effort of our own, but through His and only His mercy. Mm-hmm.